So welcome everyone. Thanks for sticking with us till the last presentation. Uh, my name is Jesse, and I'm a second year graduate student in our museum and field studies program. I'm going to be speaking with you today about the research I did on a group of objects in our anthropology collections here at the CU Museum of Natural History. But before I introduce my research, I'd like to invite a little bit of audience participation. So looking at the image here, which is one of the objects I worked with, I want to offer you an opportunity to see what we did as students through close looking at an object to see what it alone can tell you before you begin your research. This is one of the objects I worked with, and this is how I encountered it in our collections, positioned and looking like this. But I can promise you that it is not what it seems at first glance. So I put this question to you. If this is not a bowl, then what is it? And if you have already figured out what it is, then try to justify why you think it is that thing. Anyone shot in the dark? Yeah, I think, I think it was. <laughs> but, but looking at it, how might you tell it's a hat if you're practicing close looking at an object? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was definitely something we were all looking for in our objects of like if you could see any kind of use or just wear down marks to see if it had been worn on someone's head or held in a hand. Um, a couple of them do have hair in them and <laughs> very small little hairs that are quite stuck in there so they don't seem to be from us museum folks. <laughs> so you can see them if it's turned upside down, um, but you couldn't see the decorations on the top if it's positioned like a bowl. Yeah, so those were all just simple things that we were looking for when we were examining our objects in our class exercises and in our own research. So in this case, a simple flip reveals the truth that this is a ceremonial hat worn by a very specific group of people in specific contexts. And this is to illustrate that point of our class that the way we view certain cultural objects in museums are informed by our own cultural context and the way we were raised and our understandings. All right. So today I'm gonna to be telling you about the research I conducted on the Klamath River area basket hats in our collection. I chose this topic for two reasons. First, because I had just finished curating an exhibit of basketry, which you can see downstairs, and I was interested to continue researching baskets in a different way that wasn't so much focused on public output, but on in-depth research with the primary source materials, the objects, and with secondary source, mater source materials. And secondly, more personally, the Klamath River area of Northern California is my personal favorite place to be in this world. So I was really interested to learn more about the people who have always called that place home and how they related to the landscape in a way that I also relate to that landscape. All right. During this presentation, I hope to take the audience on a journey to discover what basket hats are, what their social lives and meanings are, and what their contemporary contexts are. The University of Colorado Museum of Natural History currently cares for a collection of nine basket hats from the Hoopa, Yurok, and Karuk groups from Northwest California. From my research on this collection, I argue that basket hats are a gendered object made and used in a gendered context. They're an object that confers and communicates womanhood. I will be showing how basket hats are made and used by women and also how they play a role in constituting their personhood. So what are basket hats? That story begins with the people who make them. The Hoopa, Yurok, and Karuk are people of the Klamath and Trinity Rivers in Northwest California. Though affected in many serious ways by colonialism, they were never displaced from their homelands and maintain as strong a connection as ever to the rivers and to the land. These homelands are full of thick forests, including the magnificent coastal redwoods of California. The rivers and forests bring rich resources that sustain both life and cultural practices. Many of these resources are incorporated into the making of basket hats. Despite their linguistic autonomy, the Hoopa, Yurok, and Karuk frequently traded, shared ceremonies, and intermarried. From a basketry perspective, this means that their basket making traditions, styles, and materials were similarly intertwined. All of the different aspects of a woman weaving a basket hat from the gathering of plants, their preparation, the weaving, the designs, and into the wearing of the hat in different social contexts are connected and are instrumental to our understanding of the objects 
and their importance to women. Therefore, our story of this basket hat begins in the forests of Northwest California, while women gather materials for months or even years in advance of weaving a single hat. Plant materials for basket hat making can only be gathered at specific seasonal times, which are different for each plant. The warp or foundation sticks of a basket hat are made from either hazel or willow shoots that are gathered in April, May, and August along the rivers. The weft of a basket hat is made from conifer roots that can be dug throughout the year at any time. Bear grass gives the white overlay color on a basket hat, and that is best gathered during the spring and summer. Maidenhair fern stems give the black color and are gathered in the spring. And woodwardia fern dyed with alder bark gives the red overlay color, and that is gathered in the fall and the winter. Finally, porcupine quills, used as an overlay material, can be gathered all year, but are extremely difficult to obtain and to work with. Woodpecker skins and dentalia shells might also be added to, as decoration to the outside of a basket hat after the weaving was complete. The basket hats in our collection are wonderful examples of this because they contain almost all these different types of plant materials, allowing us to see the huge variety within this type of object, even just within this very small collection. Once all the materials have been gathered and prepared, it is finally time to start weaving the basket hat. As with gathering, families of women would often weave hats together. Because weaving a hat was such a high achievement and was considered the most difficult type of basket to weave, women who wove hats have a special status among basket weavers in the community. The most distinguishing feature of weaving a basket hat and what is the easiest way to identify them in a collection as not being a bowl is this three-zone banding technique that you can see on the right. This is evident on all of the hats in our museum's collections and was what helped me to identify them as not being bowls. Each basket hat should have three zones pronounced by a raised woven stick separating them. These zones symbolize a woman's childhood on the top, adulthood in the center, and elder life along the rim. How you measure these three zones would traditionally be based on the wearer's hands and the wearer's finger size. This also tells us something about relationships between women, because if you need to know the wearer to make the hat, that would mean that women were weaving hats for each other in their families. The materials have been gathered and the weaver has begun to weave. Next, it is time to incorporate design into the basket hat so that each one will be unique. Traditional Hoopa, Yurok, and Karuk basket hats featured odd numbered designs in geometric patterns. Design patterns were owned by great houses within the communities, which also owned the specific dances and ceremonies. That meant that the women of a great house all wore hats with variations of the same house's pattern. Our collection contains variations of three different design patterns, the flint, elk, and friendship designs. The flint, shown here on these three hats, is a very old design and one that is the most common in museum collections. Flint or obsidian was a marker of wealth in the community and was used as a currency. This tells us that basket hats were an object that could help convey status of a woman wearing it. The elk and friendship designs are also quite common in museum collections as they were very appealing to collectors. Shown here, there are three elk designs, which are also sometimes called ladder designs by the Yurok. Three tribes have different names sometimes. <laughs> Um, and that's the example that we have on the table here as well. That's an elk design. We also have examples of the friendship design on those three hats, so they're equally represented in our collection. Uh -huh. After learning what I could from the objects, I then turned to outside sources, both the contemporary and older ethnographies, to help illuminate the social meanings of these objects. The materials have been gathered, the weaving begun, and the designs incorporated. Next, we will look at what kinds of hats are made once the process is complete. The Hoopa, Yurok, and Karuk recognize four different types of basket hats. Women's work hats, men's hats, women's ceremonial hats, and widow's hats. Women's work hats, shown here on the left, were primarily used for supporting the strap of a carrying basket when gathering or of a baby basket. They were also used for sun protection, keeping hair out of your face while working, protection from sap when collecting nuts, and as units of measure for tobacco, seeds, fish, or other items. 
men's hats, shown there on your right, were very plain with no design. They would also be used for protection from fishing poles when dip netting, because the poles would be braced against your head, for protection from the sun and as units of measure. Although men and women both wore basket hats, I argue that they are still a very gendered object as men wore very plain and functional, design, and functional hats only, but women wore specifically designed hats in every aspect of their lives and all throughout their lives. Women's ceremonial hats, shown there on your right, are very distinct. They are flat topped and should be covered entirely with design. The ceremonial hat would follow a woman throughout her ceremonial life. All of the hats in our UCM collection, including the one on the table, are examples of women's ceremonial hats, easily identifiable by their flat tops and the designs covering the entire exterior. The final category of hat on our left is the widow's hat, which was the plainest of the hats that women wore. When women were in mourning after the death of a husband, they would cut off all of their hair and wear this very plain cap to symbolize that they were in mourning. This is another great example of how this type of object can communicate a different aspect of womanhood. Gathering, weaving, and design have all occurred, and we know what kinds of basket hats are possible to make. But how does someone traditionally get a basket hat? For men to obtain work hats, they would traditionally be made by a spouse or a mother. For women to obtain work hats or widow's hats, they would be made by older women in their family. And as for ceremonial hats, a girl would usually receive her first hat at the completion of dancing in her flower dance, which is a coming of age ceremony in all three communities. Essentially, women receive different hats at different times in their lives, and they would traditionally circulate within families. Unfortunately, we do not know much about the history of circulation of the basket hats in our collection before they arrived at this museum, but we do know that they came from collectors who collected in the mid to late 1900s. Considering our entire collection at the University of Colorado Museum is entirely women's ceremonial hats, and those are the hats that can really tell us the most about women's roles, it is also important to look briefly at women's ceremonial lives. Women wore basket hats in four major ceremonies, also called dances, among the Hoopa, Yurok, and Karuk. Though the indigenous names for these different dances vary, today they are known as the jump dance, the white deer skin dance, the brush dance, and the flower dance. I'll look briefly at the last two. The brush dance, uh, archival images of which are shown here, is a curing ceremony held for a sick child to or to ensure the future health and welfare of a child. Men and women both perform in regalia in this ceremony, but the role of the curing doctor is always performed by a female doctor who wears a basket hat during the ceremony. Next, and perhaps the most prominent aspect of a woman's ceremonial life was the flower dance, which is a coming of age ceremony at Menarche when she would receive new regalia for the first time. The young woman on the left in the front is the girl performing the flower dance, and you can tell by the um, blue jay feathered veil that she wears, and she's also received her cap at the end of the dance. Reflected in these dances, we see the importance of women's ceremonial lives in being to ensure the health and continuance of the community. So when women wore these basket hats in ceremony, they were physical and tangible symbols for that responsibility. Unfortunately, again, we do not know if the ceremonial hats in our collection were ever danced or used in either of these ceremonies, but knowing about their symbolic meaning in this context can certainly add some significance. When doing research on the older basket hats in our collection, I also became very interested in exploring the contemporary context of these hats. Two major events in Hoopa, Yurok, and Karuk history have greatly impacted the creation, circulation, and social lives of basket hats and have also affected the lives of women in tremendous ways. These events are the California gold rush of the mid 1800s and the massive amount of collecting of California basketry in the late 1800s. Between 1845 and 1870, the native population of California dropped from 150,000 to 30,000. People died as a result of hunger, disease, displacement, and outright violence in the form of bounties and massacres perpetrated by newly arrived American miners and sanctioned by the state of California. There was rampant resource destruction and cultural destruction as ways of passing down knowledge were greatly disrupted. 
This also coincided with the height of the curio trade of California basketry, which is dated to 1880 through 1920. Buyers, collectors, and anthropologists came into communities like the Hoopa, Yurok, and Karuk and collected as many baskets as possible for sale or for museums. Many weavers began adapting to the market's demands and were weaving basket hats specifically for sale. For example, some weavers began weaving smaller hats that would not even fit a person because they could make them a lot faster. The hats in our museum are likely all made right during or after this period of the curio trade, but we don't have enough information to say for certain what date they were made. The revival of the making, wearing, and dancing of basket hats today is well underway and is linked to a larger pattern of the revival of cultural practices, including the ceremonies in which basket hats are worn. For example, the flower dance, has been reinvigorated since the 1990s after not having been practiced for over 80 years. Hoopa, Yurok, and Karuk women still wear basket hats at important times in their lives, which help to signify their identity as indigenous women. For example, women often wear basket hats at graduations or at weddings in addition to wearing them at the revived ceremonial dances. Another interesting change that has come about recently is an entirely new way of making basket hats. Crocheted hats are the latest innovation to be made in place of the work hats that were once made for men and women. I have an example of one here that you're welcome to check out at the end. Um, I just purchased that from a Yurok weaver because I really wanted a basket hat of my own and this is the only affordable kind today. <laughs> All right. Um, as I have spent so much time reading about Hoopa, Yurok, and Karuk women's lives, but I'm not myself from that community, it was important to me to conclude my research with the voices of some Native women from these communities today. The following is a story from Stephanie Lumsden, who is an enrolled member of the Hoopa Valley Tribe and recently graduated with her master's in Native American studies. Of her own basket hat, she says, I had seen basket caps before, but always thought of them as far away things, something that was not for me to have or hold. I felt so envious of the girls I saw in pictures who looked pretty in their caps. I don't even know how to put one on. And speaking of buying her first hat, she continues, I wore my cap for the rest of the day and couldn't stop smiling. I felt like I had been introduced to myself in a whole new way. I have worn my cap to ceremony, to academic conferences across the country, to my graduation celebration, and just around the house when I felt like I needed to. My cap reminds me to be patient and deliberate about the things that I do. It is the most precious thing I own because it is a part of me. I'd also like to show you a very short video of Stephanie wearing her hat and speaking hoopa at an indigenous language revival conference. It's important to hear her voice, but you can also see her incredibly proud smile. I believe that this research project has relevance for the communities today because the wearing and dancing of basket hats is a tradition that is currently being revived. Many in the communities are very worried because there are not a lot of weavers left and not many young people are learning today. That adds a new level of importance to these older collections as both objects with the potential to be used again and objects that could instruct future generations. Thank you.